Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our leap year edition of the GHS Readiness Webinar. Uh, today's session is called How to Transition to the Globally Harmonized System. So today we're going to, uh, we've got a couple of presenters from Sidehawk here. They'll talk for 30 minutes or so, and then we'll try to leave uh, 5 to 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you have a question, what you can do is you will see a questions panel on your webinar control panel. And if you type in your question, we will aggregate those throughout the session, and then we will get to as many of those as possible at the end. And you will also see, to control the control panel, uh, you'll see a, uh, an orange box with a white arrow, and you can minimize and expand that, uh, that box uh, if you need to go full screen on your video presentation. So today we've got uh, two speakers uh, from our company. We've got uh, Scott Williams. First, and Scott Williams is the director of sales for Sidehawk, and he's got a background in environmental safety consulting. And his role is to advise companies in the evaluation and selection of electronic chemical data management systems. And then we also have Ruth Mayo, and Ruth is a re regulatory compliance specialist for Sidehawk, and she has over seven years of environmental industry experience and is responsible for chemical information management and regulatory compliance at Sidehawk. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Scott Williams. Scott. Thanks, Craig. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate everyone taking a few minutes out for us to spend some time educating uh, on what we see as a, one of the more significant changes in the regulatory environment in, in our uh, current and uh, previous uh, experience as an organization that deals with uh, chemical safety data management. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, GHS readiness. Uh, specifically, uh, we're going to give you an overview of GHS and the status on what's going on currently. Uh, we're going to talk about specifically what's changed and the areas that they've changed and how that will impact uh, individual facilities and uh, organizations related to the transition for uh, hazard communication uh, with GHS. And then finally, we're going to give you a transition plan and program, basically some suggestions and tips and thoughts on what we believe will help organizations like yourselves uh, transition and meet some of the new regulatory requirements associated with GHS. And, and I think today what we'll do is uh, Ruth will probably cover the, the technical overview for us, and I'll turn it over to her in just a moment. Um, I do want to make a, a note uh, to everyone that's online with us and listening in. Uh, we are going to focus mainly on how this uh, GHS will change and impact hazard communication today. We do have other webinar series on the changes specifically related to authoring GHS compliant documents. Feel free to uh, send us an email to uh, find out more about that when those occur. Uh, but we do want to focus on the specific changes and transition required uh, related to hazard communication in the workplace and, and uh, go from there. So with that, Ruth, I'm going to turn it over to you for the GHS overview and status update. All right. Um, so first of all, let's just talk about um, briefly what GHS is. Uh, most of you probably know that GHS stands for the, Glo the Globally Harmonized System of Classification and Labeling of Chemicals. The main goal of GHS is to achieve a common and coherent approach to defining and classifying hazards, and then communicating that information on your labels and on your safety data sheet. GHS utilizes a standardized approach to define health, physical, and environmental hazards. It also standardizes the way that we will classify hazards associated with chemicals. GHS much more clearly and prescriptively lays out the methods for classifying both pure substances as well as mixtures. And then finally, GHS standardizes the way we're going to be communicating those hazards in the workplace and then to downstream users. Uh, the main purpose of GHS is to provide the underlying infrastructure for national chemical safety programs. It's important to note GHS is not a regulation. It's a guide that pre-existing regulatory bodies or agencies can adopt from. So now let's talk briefly about the benefits of GHS. Um, first of all, let's just take GHS completely out of the picture for a moment. Currently, every country has a different system for communica communicating chemical hazard information. And there's very little consistency among those systems. So with that being said, GHS is needed to first achieve a unified form of communication across multiple countries and agencies, presenting a clear and consistent message for those handling hazardous chemicals. 
Another benefit is reduced cost. GHS reduces the need for duplicate testing, such as your ecotox testing or your toxicological testing, and then evaluation for your products. Chemicals will only need to be classified once for all agencies and countries, which means that the cost associated with communication should decrease. Safety data sheets and labels will only need to be authored or created once, and that one document should then apply for all agencies and countries. So when all systems have adopted GHS and are using consistent methods, we will better be able to communicate chemical information. And with better communication comes enhanced protection for those handling hazardous chemicals. Because the messages will be presented consistently regardless of the agency or country, that means that those exposed to hazardous chemicals will be better able to handle, transport, use, and dispose of those chemicals properly. So this means that we will have better protection for our workers. And then finally, the last benefit is improved international trade. The unification resulting from a harmonized system will allow those in the chemical world to much more easily cross borders. You, you know, Ruth, I know we're talking about the benefits. <clears throat> and, and for example, I was at a facility, <clears throat> excuse me, speaking on GHS and the specific impacts to that facility um, a couple of weeks back, and, and one of the, the management team was asking, you know, they feel like there's going to be significant burden initially. There is some time and effort involved in transitioning, and we're going to give you some tips at the end of this presentation on how to do so. Uh, but the bottom line is we do want to protect workers. That's OSHA's mandate, and there are costs associated with workplace injury. So by reducing costs and, and being consistent in our approach to the chemical hazard classifications, to where information is found on the safety data sheet, and some of the other changes that GHS will bring, there will be a long-term reduced cost and benefit, in, in essence, having a safer workplace. And so, you know, we talk about GHS benefits, and a lot of people are concerned about cost. The long-term is there really is a significant benefit to GHS, to standardization, and we'll help demonstrate how you'll transition as we go through this process. All right, so here this slide, we want to represent how GHS is being adopted on a global basis. Um, first of all, I just want to talk about the basic concept of GHS began quite a long time ago in 1992 when the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development developed a standard practice for labeling chemicals. So here in the United States, some um, 20 years later, after committee meetings were, were held and public hearings were held, there is a three-year implementation scheduled to begin in 2012. Um, I do want to note on Feb uh, February 21st, the proposed rule did pass through the Office of Management and Budget with the concluding action of consistent with change. Um, the consistent with change status signifies that the draft rule was modified in the course of the review. It's not yet known what the extent of those changes are. Um, which means the last step is for the rule to be published officially in the Federal Register, which will then set the effective date and the transition period will then begin. The timing of publication to the, to the Federal Register is not known at this time. However, we do expect it to be sometime this month. And, and so suffice to say, that was the final major hurdle before GHS becomes law here in the U.S. That's right. So other countries are, are actually moving forward with GHS adoption as well. Um, Canada is moving forward with their GHS implementation. Um, consultation with stakeholders is currently ongoing in Canada. Um, and GHS implementation will be at least two years once that legislative process actually begins. Um, and they are planning on a transition period much like the one that OSHA is proposing. One thing I'll add there, we do business with a uh, partner who offers safety and consulting services and training services in Canada. And they've had contact with regulatory officials um, there, uh, they are being told the same thing, uh, a five to six year total transition plan. They will, it appears, follow the U.S. lead and approximately two to three years after our final implementation day, Canada will follow suit. So Mexico is actually um, moving forward as well. They published a non-mandatory national standard on June 3rd, 2011 based upon the third revision of GHS. Most of you are probably familiar that Europe is well on its way in adopting GHS um, into their CLP regulation. Um, classification and labeling requirements are currently mandatory for pure substances as of December 1st, 2010, 
and the transition period is currently in effect for mixtures until June 1, 2015. Um, we do expect that Australia will have GHS implementation enforced sometime this year as well in 2012. Uh, New Zealand has already adopted GHS and full compliance is required as of December 31, 2010. Japan was actually one of the, the very first countries to adopt GHS. They were actually one of uh, the first countries to classify and publish a, a listing of 1,500 chemicals aligned with those new GHS classifications and guidelines. They required full compliance as of December 31, 2010. China has also already implemented GHS, and Korea is expecting a June 30, 2013 GHS implementation deadline for mixtures. And I know that you mentioned the, the Mexico uh, adoption of the, of the NOM. In essence, they're accepting uh, U.S.-based uh, format and content, which includes, as well as GHS, the current ANSI standard. And so as OSHA uh, transitions to GHS, Mexico will accept the uh, regulatory content format required in OSHA GHS related safety data sheets as well. All right, so we've taken some time and we've discussed GHS on a global scale. So let's focus here in the United States, uh, specifically in regards to OSHA's position, timetable, and enforcement of GHS. So we all know that OSHA is planning on revising the current hazard communication standards to align with GHS. They have stated that they will be maintaining their current regulatory framework, only changing those provisions that need to be changed to align with GHS. OSHA's primary purpose, just as it was under the old hazard communication standards, is to reduce chemical source illnesses and injuries. So in other words, to enhance protection for those working and handling chemicals, working with and handling chemicals. So now let's focus on OSHA's timetable. Uh, within the, past, the last few years, OSHA began making a lot of headway in its GHS adoption and implementation. In October 2009, OSHA published their Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Public hearings were concluded in the spring of 2010, and we do now expect a 2012 date for adoption since the proposed rule has now passed through the Office of Management and Budget. Once the final rule is published into the Federal Register, implementation will be effective, and then that transition period will begin. During this transition period, you will be required to train your employees within two years, and full compliance will be required at the end of the three years. And then finally, it's important to note that during this transition period, compliance with either the new or the current rule is sufficient. But at the end of the period, you will then be required to be fully compliant with the new rule. You know, before we go to the second part of our uh, presentation on specifics on what's changing, one thing to note that while we see a timeline for change and for adoption here in the U.S., in the business that's aware, we're already seeing these changes occur. If you do business across the globe, whether you buy your products for someone outside the U.S. or if you ship your products to someone outside the U.S., the odds are that you're currently being impacted by GHS in some form or fashion. For example, when we ship a product for uh, to Europe, that material safety data sheet that accompanies the product has to have EUCLP agency classifications, format, and content on it. So we are already seeing safety data sheets being authored. We are creating safety data sheets for people that meet the agency classifications as a result of GHS changes around the world. And in the business that they're in, we notice more and more each and every day that uh, safety data sheets are starting to have that content available. We'll talk about how that impacts you in the workforce in the second part and in the final uh, transition tips, but I just want to talk about that because while we're talking about a timetable and a transition, the simple fact of the matter is it may already be impactful in the workplace today or yesterday or tomorrow. So second part, and, and uh, I always have to get my word in sideways with Ruth because she is, is, is our technical expert here. Uh, we're going to talk about what's changing, and you're going to go through each of those in depth. Is that right? That's exactly right. So just to kind of touch on what's going to be changing um, or what we expect to be changing to the current hazard communication standard, first of all, um, our general understanding of hazard classification will be changing. We will be move, moving away from a performance-oriented approach to a more defined and prescriptive approach. Um, there will be hundreds of thousands of MSDSs, if not more, 
Millions. Gui millions, <laughs> all right, that will need to be updated or reauthored to meet GHS guidelines. And then likewise, labels will need to be regenerated or re, um, re processed, if you will, utilizing the standardized pictograms, signal words, and hazard and precautionary statements. <clears throat> and then once you've reauthored your new safety data sheets and labels, you will then need to communicate that new information internally as well as to your downstream users. And then lastly, your employees will need to be trained on the new format and content of safety data sheets as well as labels. So let's dig in on each one of these changes individually because this, this is kind of the meat of what we're talking about. How will this impact you and what specific changes are occurring related to hazard communication? And we'll start with hazard classifications, is that right? That's exactly right. Um, so currently under the hazard communication standard, hazard classifications are performance oriented, which means that hazards are evaluated on fairly vague and broad criteria. Well, under the new proposed rule, specific detailed criteria are provided to help guide the evaluation into the classification of the chemical. Classification will now mean that hazards are evaluated not only for existence, but as well as for severity. So let's talk about which um, GHS categories OSHA is planning on adopting. They are planning on adopting all GHS health hazards except for acute toxicity category 5, um, corrosion irritation category 3, aspiration hazard category 2. They have also, also stated that they'll be adopting all physical hazard classes and categories. OSHA will not be adopting environmental hazards. Um, currently, that's out of their jurisdiction. Um, it's under EPA's guidelines, those environmental hazards are. And EPA may be adopting GHS in the, in the future. So I, I'm going to kind of depart a little bit here Generally, this is going to be more impactful for someone who is trying to understand what the hazards associated with the use or exposure of the chemical are, or someone who's authoring a document. And that's grounds for an entire separate webinar on the changes related to authoring a document in the GHS compliant format. We'll, we'll, we'll address that at a later date. But I do know that this uh, is impactful really because in the section of the safety data sheet that will show these classifications, there are prescribed rules, and those should be more consistent across safety data sheets as a result of these rules. That's exactly right. Um, and then finally, the way that we think about and handle mixtures will change. Under the new proposed rule, uh, mixture rules are specific to each hazard class. And there's three basic tiers that GHS uses to determine mixture classifications. At the very first tier, you look for available test data on the mixture as a whole to provide you with the classification. When that information is not available, you then move to the second tier, which is to utilize bridging principles to help extrapolate data on your mixture. And then finally, if you cannot utilize those bridging principles, um, then you move to the last tier, where you can use cutoffs or formulas based upon the known hazards of your ingredients. So here I also wanted to talk about a few additional um, items to consider when we're, we're talking about hazard classification changes. Um, currently, um, under the hazard communication standard, all hazards are evaluated and then communicated downstream in the form of MSDSs and labels. Well, in evaluating hazards, there currently is flexibility in the use of professional judgment to identify the most relevant hazards associated with chemicals. Underneath that new proposed rule, all hazards are to be classified, meaning that there's specific detailed criteria for determining hazard classifications for chemicals which means that there's going to be much less flexibility when classifying. Um, another uh, additional point to consider is the discussion of unclassified hazards. Um, this is actually a new classification unique to OSHA under the new proposed rule. Basically what this classification means is that if there is scientific evidence that a hazard may occur in the workplace, that this hazard is not covered under the current physical or health criteria, you can add this hazard under the unclassified hazard definition. This definition was important to add to ensure that there were no gaps in coverage between the current rule and the new proposed rule. This information will be required on labels, safety data sheets, as well as address and worker training. A good example of this is um, the combustible dust hazard that OSHA is planning on um, adding to the new proposed rule. And then finally here, um, I want to touch upon the building block approach. GHS allows for countries and agencies to adopt portions of GHS which best fit within their current regulatory guidelines. 
And what that means is those classifications may not be 100% harmonized across agencies and countries. All right, so let's talk about how specifically the MSDS is going to change. Uh, first and foremost, the name is going to change. So you'll no longer refer to them as material safety data sheets, but now they will be just safety data sheets. All those yellow binders, or MSDS binders, will become SDS binders or SDS systems. That's right. Um, the format will also change on the, the safety data sheet. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar that currently OSHA does not specify how many sections or in what order information is displayed on the MSDS. But OSHA will now be requiring a 16-section safety data sheet in a specified order. Um, OSHA has stated that they will not be regulating the data found in certain sections of the, the safety data sheet. They will not be regulating the, the data found in Section 12, which is your ecological information, Section 13, which is your disposal information, Section 14, which is your transportation information, or Section 15, which is your regulatory information. However, you will be required to have at least the headings for these sections on your safety data sheet. Another thing to note is that sections two and three of the, the safety data sheet will be swapped. So section two is now the emergency overview, and section three is your component or ingredient section. A lot of, a lot of people ask, why did they swap those sections? The main reason behind doing this was so that the most critical important and important information regarding your chemical, those health and those physical hazards, could be readily identified on the first few, few pages of the safety data sheet. And then, again, the 16-section format is probably familiar to all of you. ANSI actually adopted um, this format in their Z400 2004 standard. But again, this new format will be required when GHS is implemented. And then your safety data sheets will also need to be reclassified based upon the new GHS criteria. And those new classifications will need to be communicated on the safety data sheet in Section 2. There will be new health, physical, and environmental classifications. And it's going to be very important for you to understand these new GHS classifications so that you can communicate that information to your employees. So, Scott, if you'll go to the next slide here, you'll see this is just a representation of all of the new GHS um, health and physical hazards. So we have our health and environmental hazards listed in the first column here, and then those physical hazards, hazards listed in the, the last two columns. Let me go back to that previous slide. That's right, because I want to just touch again briefly uh, with about upon the building block approach. Um, again, we do need to remember that GHS is only a guide. Therefore, it does allow for what is referred to as this building block approach, which I already touched upon briefly um, on a previous slide. But what that means, again, is that countries and agencies can adopt those parts of GHS which best fit within their current regulatory framework. OSHA is planning on implementing this building block approach. A really good example of this is with acute toxicity. So currently under GHS, Acute toxicity is broken down into five basic categories. Category one being the most acute, acutely toxic, and category five being the least acutely toxic. Since category five is currently outside OSHA's enforcement, they have chosen to not adopt this category into their new rule. So OSHA will only have categories one through four for acute toxicity. All right, so now let's talk about how the workplace labels are going to change. First and foremost, labels will no longer be performance oriented, but will now be standardized. Every DHS physical health and environmental hazard classification has a specific signal word associated with it, hazard statements, precautionary statements, and pictograms. Based upon the new DHS criteria, there are actually now only going to be two signal words. Um, we're used to having caution being a signal word under ANSI, but now we'll just be dealing with danger and warning as the two signal words for GHS. We also have hazard statements and precautionary statements. There is a complete listing of all of these within the UNGHS Purple Book, and it's important to note that each hazard statement and precautionary statement has a corresponding H&P code, and you're probably familiar with that with Europe and their R&S phrases. 
Now there's also going to be new GHS pictograms. So these pictograms are actually located on the right-hand side of your slide here. And most of these should look really familiar to you. Um, the biggest change is going to be this red border, which is new to GHS. But there are three new pictograms that GHS introduces. And these are located on the bottom row of, of the slide here. Um, the first one here is the exclamation point. Um, this pictogram represents your acute hazards, such as your eye and skin irritants. The second pictogram here is your silhouette pictogram, which represents chronic hazards, such as your carcinogens. And then finally is your environmental hazard pictogram, which represents aquatic toxicity. So this slide right here is just an example of a GHS label. Um, I do want to mention that labels um, do not have a required format. However, there are required elements for a GHS label. These required elements include the name of your material and product, a signal word, if appropriate, your hazard statements and precautionary statements, your pictogram, your manufacturer name and phone number, as well as any supplemental information as provided by the agency or country. Um, there are certain elements that are required to be located together on your label. These elements are your signal word, your pictograms, and your hazard statements. And then finally, the last thing that I want to touch upon, and Scott, yeah, do you want to jump Before in? we jump into that next uh, couple of topics on change, specific changes, talking about labeling, one of the things that we've noticed and talked about and has been brought uh, up both with NFP and HMIS, we talk about the differences in classifications where uh, most uh, workplace and workforce uh, employees are used to an NFP or HMIS label format where one is the least hazardous. Uh, and four is the most hazardous. GHS is the opposite, uh, holds true, with one being the most hazardous category and five being the, the least hazardous. So the potential exists for confusion if a GHS hazard classification of one is on a label uh, where employees are used to seeing an HMIS or NFP four. And I know that both of those organizations are, are looking at GHS and how it impacts their current labeling standards uh, and, and information on how they're going to address that. I'm sure will be forthcoming from them. As we hear from those organizations, we'll pass that on. But that is one potential um, area that, uh, because of the significance of change, that companies need to be aware of when they're looking at a GHS workplace label as opposed to uh, current NFP or HMIS label. And sorry, Ruth, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'll let you jump right back in there. That's no problem. The last thing here that, that I want to discuss is um, communication and training. Um, you will need to focus on um, this information within your, your current hazard communication um, program. Um, once your safety data sheets and labels have been appropriately updated, they'll then need to be distributed and circulated to your downstream users. And then this means that it's going to be up to you to ensure that your workers are properly trained on the new information and then what that information means to them in the workplace. So if we think about this, you know, I know that the OSHA statistics were that a million uh, safety data sheets will have to be reauthored and communicated and distributed and training offered. So if we think about what we're seeing currently, we're seeing a larger influx of material safety data sheets being updated by the manufacturer with new classifications, new hazard information found on the safety data sheet, which is then flowing down to the facility. So at the, at the basic HAZCOM level, you know, imagine having a thousand material safety data sheets related to the chemicals in the workplace in your organization. You may have multiple binders or multiple uh, sets of those material safety data sheets that are changing. And you're going to see a large influx of information flowing down from the vendor, from the provider of those chemicals. Uh, that information may have changed. We'll talk about that in the transition plan that we offer and some of the suggestions that we have. But we just want to talk about that because communication is a big part of hazard communication. Uh, and the simple fact is, Every safety data sheet will have to be updated. Those changes will need to be communicated uh, downstream, and your employees, the end user or the end person exposed to any hazards associated with that chemical, will need to be trained on where the information is, what the new information means to them and their use of it, and how they find that information. So it's a pretty significant part. We touched on it briefly here, but it's one of the most significant Im impacts um, uh, and then long-term benefits associated with GHS because 
eventually the ability to standardize where information is found, what that information is across manufacturers and classifications for a particular agency, USGHS, for example, will aid the worker in knowing what hazards associated with the use of that workplace. And Ruth, I, I think I'm going to jump in since I've already taken the lead here and go into uh, the uh, steps for transition and, and offering some tips and tools on what we think uh, an organization should consider when uh, undergoing the transition over this uh, two to three year time period. So the, the first part of that we suggest is create a transition plan. Now the, the main element to that is to create a calendar. Understand the timeline, pick a date, uh, a line in the sand on when you want your organization to be transitioned. Uh, you notice here we have an, a sample program calendar with some timelines prior and uh, to and after the actual deadline. So OSHA gives us two years to train our employees, three years to fully transition. Um, our suggestion is, is that you pick a date maybe 18 months from the day the final rule is published to be fully transitioned as an organization so that you give yourself a six-month window. Keep in mind that you're going to already be seeing changes associated with the reclassification of safety data sheets. Organizations are already doing this. We see this. We are offering documents for companies who request this information now. So you'll notice that there's some topics on this calendar. Uh, perform chemical inventory, training content, training employees, acquiring updating safety data sheets. We'll go through some of the specifics of the what we consider five important steps for transition. And the first one being, though, create that transition plan. Understand the elements of it, understand the timing of it, and understand the resources you have to have to create a successful transition to the new HASCOM requirements. Um, one of those very important steps is performing a chemical inventory. So let's talk specifically about what that means and why. We think that you know, a big part of understanding and, and dealing with hazards in the workplace is um, ensuring that you know what chemicals are where in your facility. What you don't want to have to do is train employees or deal with uh, updated information or additional safety data sheets for those chemicals that are no longer in use at your facility. So tidy up your chemical um, inventory. Uh, maybe use a barcode or labeling system to identify materials and where they are in your system and then be able to go back and reconcile that with your MSDS database, I'm sorry, your SDS database. Um, understand or create chemical areas so that it is manageable so that you can inventory on a regular scheduled basis by a specific area. Generally a person or supervisor or laboratory manager or um, department head understands what's going on in their inventory area or in their chemical area and can tell you what chemicals should be in use there. Um, audit that. Create a process for ongoing chemical inventory reconciliation. Um, because of the natures of GHS and the nature of the changing regulatory environment, you want a repeatable process. You want to understand what chemicals are where. You want to reduce that count as early as you can in the process so that you aren't dealing with additional paperwork or additional training requirements but then you need it to be repeatable so that you don't get back to a scenario where you have chemicals in your workplace that you're training on that aren't used or that are no longer manufactured or they're out of date or that the hazards have been reclassified according to new rules that may have come out. Finally, take advantage of some of the technology that's out there. Um, I'm a firm believer in technology for reducing time and effort. And, and we know that barcoding systems, chemical inventory management, uh, safety data sheet management software and service providers uh, offer technology that allow you to minimize the effort involved in keeping up with your inventory, knowing what's where, and controlling it uh, through a material approval process. And that last part is important. Develop a schedule for ongoing chemical inventory management. Once you have it under control, keep it under control, tidy up that chemical inventory, and reduce the burden on the onset, and then manage it going forward so that your chemical processes are uh, kept at a minimum, and the hazards in the workplace and the risk associated with the use of those chemicals is, is minimized. Um, I'm jumping through these because I think we're probably 35, 40 minutes here, and I know we want to have some time for questions. So I'm going to talk about step three, uh, one of the more important steps, and, and that is, you'll notice on the slide, it says acquire, update, and manage the new SDSs. So I know Ruth talked about classifications of material safety data sheets. Um, the simple fact of the matter is that during the process you're going to have safety data sheets that have been classified or created or authored under the old OSHA standards. 
uh, sometimes eight sections, ten sections, information that's manufacturer directed that may not be fully compliant with the new classifications. In fact, we're, we're pretty sure that that's where we're going to be. What this means is that you're going to need some type of system for um, ensuring that you have acquired, that your vendors have provided you GHS compliant safety data sheets. You need to make sure that they're up to date and current with the proper GHS classifications. And then you need to have a system in place for managing those going forward. So some of the questions that we um, throw uh, at our customers related to MSDS management is, does your system handle, uh, and we use the term VMM for vendor MSDS management, those are inbound MSDSs, incorporate hazard classifications by agencies or pictograms or signal works. Those new hazard and precautionary statements that are GHS specific, is that system that you're currently managing using to manage your safety data sheets, does it give you access to those data points? Um, does it provide you a report that allows you to see which materials have GHS compliant information on them versus those that don't so that you understand where your gap is and, if, and you can contact those manufacturers to ensure they provide you GHS compliant documents by your transition date? Does it provide support for GHS workplace labels? So obviously there are required elements on a GHS label. Um, you can also add additional information, but you need to be able to, to pull information off the safety data sheet Generally, it's found in Section 2 of the new GHS-related format safety data sheet and output that on a workplace label efficiently and accurately. Um, does it include indexing for other agency classifications, including GHS? What we're seeing in the industry now is the potential there for a safety da uh, data sheet to have um, agency classifications from the EU and U.S. and Canadian Women's Science. So you're going to have to understand what classifications fall and is that safety data sheet compliant with your part of the world? If you buy products from a vendor in Canada, does the safety data sheet coming into your organization meet GHS compliant requirements? Uh, finally, with all the information that uh, is available on a safety data sheet, hopefully your current system or ones you're looking at will include expanded regulatory list coverage. It will allow you to understand how your facility or your chemicals in your workplace may be impacted by changing regulation. And then, of course, detailed hazard classification data is important so that you can reduce risk in the workplace. Understanding what the health of physical hazards are associated with the use of that chemical um, allows you to potentially find replacements. Or to uh, one good example I've heard from organizations out there are if they have an employee that is pregnant in the workplace, they want to ensure that they're not exposed to chemicals with reproductive effects. So how do you know if the materials in their chemical area um, have potential reproductive effects without you know, detailed hazard classification information. So as you go through this process of transitioning, consider your systems that are out there and make sure that the system will allow you to go beyond simple compliance and, and maybe be proactive and risk, uh, risk averse. Um, step four, um, update those workplace labels. I'm going to give you um, a couple examples. You'll notice on the left, there's a workplace label, a standard NFPA workplace label we see all the time. On the right is a sample of a new GHS label, and you'll see the current OSHA standard has material identification information, the hazard warnings, and, and it's interesting. And often when we go in the workplace, we see say, uh, workplace labels that don't include the actual health or physical hazards of the material. That's part of a workplace label. Um, also supplier information. You'll notice the one rating there on the NFPA workplace label. Well, if the GHS label had a one rating as, a, as opposed to that, that would be very confusing. Um, or a four rating on the GHS level, which may be more in line with the one rating on the NFPA. Again, that is an area that is a potential um, change that is significant and needs to be considered when looking at workplace labels. You'll notice on the updated uh, label there on the right that there are specific requirements, the, the material name, the signal words, uh, the uh, pictograms, the precautionary statements, the hazard statements. All that information has to be co-located there is room on the label, and, and there, are other, there are other supplemental information uh, avail available or allowed on those labels. So it's possible that some melding of existing label formats and the new GHS is there. We just aren't familiar with what NFPA or HMIS is going to do at this time. So that, that updating of your workplace labels is an important part of this transition. So between now and the date that you plan to transition, you have to also have in place a plan or any time you bring a material in, in a drum or a tote or a five-gallon pail and put it in a smaller uh, container, that it is appropriately labeled with the hazards of that chemical, and those have to meet the new prescribed requirements of GHS.
And finally, step five, conduct, my apologies here, I've got a, must have, must have hit the button a little too hard there. Step five is conduct employee training. So the changes that have occurred in this uh, transition, you know, we'll, we'll kind of summarize these in a moment, but uh, there are a few questions you should ask uh, internally, and, and uh, a couple of those are, what is your timeline? Uh, at what point do I want to be fully transitioned? And more importantly, what are the specific changes I have to make related to my current hazard communication program? Am I going to change systems? Am I going to have more information available? Do I have a process to ensure which materials are GHS compliant and which are not? Do I have a way for managing chemical inventory control going forward? Um, and then some of the questions for your employees. You know, how are they going to access these new GHS compliant safety data sheets? Are they aware of the changes to the terminology, to the content, to the labeling information? You know, they probably aren't going to need to know specifically every definition of every hazard precaution standard, HAP code, but they are going to need to know where to find that information and what that means to them in their specific use of the material. And I know we're running long, so I'm going to jump into a summary real quick and then we'll try to answer some questions. Uh, five transition uh, suggestions. Create that transition plan, picking a date a timeline, ensuring you have resources available to transition. Perform that chemical inventory so that you understand what chemicals are found and currently used in the workplace and reduce the burden going forward. Um, acquire and update those FTSs, ensuring that you have a means to determine which ones have GHS compliant information and which don't. Update those workplace labels or have a system that allows you to print workplace labels uh, that meet those new requirements. And finally, ensure that your hazard communication program has been modified and conducted training appropriate to your workforce so that they know what's going on, uh, how it impacts them, and what the changes are specifically related to their use of the chemicals and their everyday uh, work activities. So with that said, um, Craig, if it's all right with you, I'm going to leave up here for just a couple of minutes some of these resources uh, that we utilize and are available. I do want to note that ghsinformation.com is a website that we manage that is publicly available information on what's going on with GHS, a lot of resources there. Um, and I know that, Craig, you'll talk about making this available to everybody who requested it at the end. So we're going to just jump right into questions, if that's OK, simply because I know that I have run long as usual. Sorry, okay. everyone. So um, I have a question here for you, okay. Scott. Um, can I use either the old or the new system during the transition period? Absolutely. A good question. Here in the U.S., OSHA has said that both systems are um, compliant during the transition period, during the three-year transition period. Please note, though, that their current rule says that you will have to train your employees within two years. So you have three years for both systems to be found and, and compliant here in the U.S., but at the end of two years from the date the final rule is published, you will need to train your employees on that. Um, I'll tell you what, we're going through several questions have come in. Let me, I'm going to throw one back at you, Ruth, that I'm reading here. Um, this is an interesting, how will FIFRA address GHS? And, and can you define FIFRA <laughs> specifically for us? I Ruth? can. Um, FIFRA um, stands for the, the Federal um, Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Um, and FIFRA is actually um, covered under the EPA. Um, right now, and at this point in time, we're not really sure how um, EPA is going to be ad addressing GHS or if they will be. So quite honestly, we don't really know how FIFRA will address um, GHS in the future or in the long run. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting with the, the agency classifications that are out there. We anticipate, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Ruth, some melding of a GHS compliant document with FIFRA-related agency information on it so that you can meet both the requirements out there until guidance is offered. And that's how those, that's being handled in the Right, and that's how we are planning on handling that. Sitehawk is planning on handling that, yes. Yeah. All right, how about this one? Um, what happens to the old label format? I don't know if I know what that means. What, well, I'm going to take a stab at it, uh, and, and we'll try to get some clarification on the question. Uh, the, again, NFP and HMIX, uh, are the standards that most people use for workplace labels. Both of them have indicated that they're aware of GHS changes and the potential impact related to that. Uh, we don't have specific guidance, but we do have um, information from both those organizations that they do plan to 
um, incorporate or a, a, um, adjust or or not so much adjust that's probably not or the proper word um, work within the bounds of GHS so it'll be interesting to see what happens if potential is there that you may see a, a container that has the old NSPA label and the new GHS mm -hmm. label information on it um, there's no specific guidance the simple fact is that you will have to have GHS related information on a workplace label um, and uh, that information uh, will come off of the safety data sheet once it's been reclassified. And here's a question to follow that up then, Scott. Where can we get GHS labels to update our workplace labels? So that would me again. Where can we get GHS labels to update our workplace labels? You know, that's a great question. Yeah. We're, we're actually talking to several different label manufacturing organizations. The business, and we try not to make this a, a sales type, it's, it's more of an informational webinar, but the business that we're in, we get um, discussions with label manufacturers like Brady or Label Master Graphics products, and all of those are, are trying to understand whether you're going to have a pre-printed label or you're going to have information that populates out of a, some system where the information for populating a workplace label resides. So, for example, um, in, in our business, in our system, we're going to provide GHS related data that will output onto a uh, either pre-printed label stock or a blank label stock and go to a printer. So the information actually comes from section two uh, of the safety data sheet, including the pictograms, the signal word, and the, the hazard uh, statements and precautionary statements. So that information will come from the, the workplace. So the how you get it onto a label that affixes is still uh, being decided on in the industry. There are several different options out there. Um, Ruth, I'm going to throw one back over the fence at you. It looks like, um, let's see, are country-specific SDSs um, expected uh, for each GHS country that adopts GHS? It, it sounds like they're probably referring to your discussion on building blocks and that, that certain safety data right. sheets may be specific classifications. Right. We, we definitely know that different agencies are adopting GHS kind of in their own manner. However, very well, you may see a safety data sheet that, that encompasses multiple agencies' classifications on one document. Um, so you may see one safety data sheet that has the OSHA GHS classifications as well as the, the EU CLP classifications. So no, not necessarily. Um, do, you, do each country have to have their own safety data sheet? Okay. So Craig, do we have time for one or two more? Are we one more? Okay. So. Um, How about I ask you this last one then, Scott? Okay. Um, what about old products no longer manufactured that we have on hand? Do we have to update MSDSs to safety data sheets? You know, that, that's a great question, and it, there's there's a couple different potential answers for that. So if I understand the question, the way the way I hear that question being asked is, say you have a uh, an old safety data sheet um, in your notebook, and you have a drum of the product on hand. Um, Realistically, the manufacturer should provide you an updated safety data sheet for that product. Because it's in the workplace, if your safety data sheet doesn't meet GHS compliant requirements, then you'll need to contact the manufacturer and ensure that they supply you a GHS compliant safety data sheet because you do have that chemical in the workplace and you're using it. Now, the converse of that is if you have archives of records, which is the OSHA standard for 30 years keeping chemical hazard data, um, you're not going to have to go back and have all of those SDSs updated to the classification. Those information is archive information. My understanding is that you're not going to have to do a thing about that. So w we can explore that a little more fully with the individual who asked if we need to. And, and I know we've run long, and I want to thank everybody. Craig, you're going to jump back in here and explain where we go from here? That's right. Um, first of all, let me thank all of you on the phone and, and the web for attending. Hopefully you got to some useful and valuable information out of this. And secondly, let me thank Ruth and Scott for uh, presenting today. Just two housekeeping items. One, we will make the webinar um, slides and presentation available to you after the session. Uh, you should receive uh, an email uh, probably within the day with a link to the recorded webinar. And then give us a day or so, day or two, to get these slides posted to our website, uh, which you can find as well. And then if there's any unanswered questions, we'll make sure we address those personally uh, within the next week and get back to you on that as well. So with that, we'll wrap up, and thank you again. Bye. Thanks, everyone.